We're going to move on to section five now, which is, I guess we're talking about the individual planets a little bit and talking about, it's a bit of a smash hits question, but what your favorite planet is. Yeah. The solar system consists of three major types of planet, ice giant, gas giant, and terrestrial. These are produced because the protoplanetary disk has different proportions of rock and ice, depending on its distance from the sun. Terrestrial planets develop closer to the sun, where the protoplanetary disk is mainly rock, whilst ice giants developed further away from the sun, where the protoplanetary disk is made of ice. And finally, for this part of the, the section, um, we're going to move on to uh, section six, which we're, we're, we're going to talk about life in the solar system. You've got a little bit on that. Again, I can't find the bookmark. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want I'll tell you what I'll read. I'll, yeah. I'll read a bit. Again, it's uh, off piste. Um, the, another of the great bits of um, technology that I got to play with and use in the series was Alvin, which was um, it's a submarine which was built in the 60s, actually, which is one of the most capable submarines ever built. It can go down to four kilometers or more underneath the sea. Now, if you think about it, the atmospheric pressure, the pressure on, on, on a submarine increases by one atmosphere every 10 meters. Now, we dived two kilometers, so that gives you a 200 atmospheres pressure on the hull of this thing. So it's made of titanium. It's a titanium sphere, and, and it takes about... The whole dive took about eight hours. Um, it takes about two hours to get down and two hours to get back, which means that when you're on the surface of the uh, seabed, two kilometers below the surface of the ocean, um, you're, you're further away from the ground than the space shuttle is from the ground, because the space shuttle comes back from orbit more quickly than you can get up in Alvin. Boy. So it's an, it's an amazing thing. I'm quite claustrophobic, um, actually. So I, I wrote... Again, this kind of diary style in, in the book. Um, on the morning of our Albin dive, I confess to having been irrationally apprehensive. <laughs> uh, irrational, because Albin has a perfect safety record stretching back almost 50 years. But apprehensive, because on the ocean floor beneath the Sea of Cortez, this little 4.9 centimetre thick titanium sphere will be subjected to a pressure 200 times Earth at Earth's atmospheric pressure and will be utterly isolated from the rest of the world. Alvin is not large or luxurious. Its living quarters are 208 centimeters, it's 81 inches in diameter, which is just big enough to allow three people to sprawl inside with legs partially intertwined, unless you can sit cross-legged for eight hours, which I can't. <laughs> the, the curved, polished titanium sides of the sphere are exposed where racks of equipment and oxygen, oxygen cylinders do not obscure them. Alvin carries enough air for a three-day stay under the ocean should rescue become necessary. The most exciting features of the vessel are three thick portholes that become beautifully and unnervingly transparent once submerged. Through these windows, generations of undersea explorers have gazed out across the ocean's most exotic and alien vistas. That's that part over with. You know, what we're going to do is we're going to um, throw uh, look, look some questions amongst you, the audience. So down here, this gentleman in the black... Uh, Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so every day in the media, we're seeing more uh, interesting stuff coming out from the Large Hadron Collider. Um, what uh, particular aspects uh, are you looking forward to um, when they start ramping up the energies beyond 3.5 TeV? Yeah, so, so the, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is currently running at half energy, which is the collision to 7 TeV in our language. That's terra electron volts. I could, I'll give you a definition. <laughs> well, no, you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hang on. Let me feel the, this. Uh, an electron volt is the energy an electron gets if you accelerate it through a potential difference of one volt. So a nine volt battery would give you a nine electron volt beam. So the LHC runs at uh, three and a half tera electron volts per beam, which is three and a half million million electron volts. So it's like a three and a half million million volt battery on each beam. Um, so. At that energy, that might be enough, is the first thing to say, because it's still three and a half times the energy of anything else that we've ever had. And one of the key things we're looking for is the origin of something called electroweak symmetry breaking, which in standard language is the, the time in the universe's life when mass appeared for the first time. So, so literally, when the, if you look at your hand, it's made up of protons and neutrons, which are made up of quarks and electrons that are going around the atoms. All those things have mass. And we're very sure that at a, around a billionth of a second after the universe began, something happened 
was it something called a phase transition, but something happened such that some particles got mass and some didn't. And the LHC is already operating in that energy regime now. So one of the answers can be the Higgs boson, which many people have heard of. That's a theory for, for what does that. If that's true, then you find Higgs bosons and you can find them with the energy we've got now, uh, probably. Uh, if not, then whatever the mechanism is, you will see it because we know where to look. So that's certainly in the planned discoveries, as it were, of the LHC. I think that's the most exciting. Um, and you, you may, if you need the extra energy, then the plan is to shut down in about a year's time, upgrade certain protection systems, and then run at seven. But, but actually, uh, I could talk forever about this. It's actually <laughs> running very well now. It's, running, it's, it's, it's exceeding our expectations in terms of numbers of collisions per second m massively at the moment. So um, th there's a temptation not to, not to play around with it and just keep taking data, which is what we're doing, and keep looking. Um, th the last thing I'd say is that whilst that is the most exciting, so the origin of mass is probably the most exciting thing you could uh, in the planned discoveries. Um, things like uh, supersymmetry, which is a theory that may provide the answer to the question, what is dark matter? So what is a lot of the universe made of? Um, those things are also sort of there on the agenda, and in some sense easier to see than, than the origin of mass. So it's, it's, it is actually very exciting at the moment. There's a huge amount of data that we've got there. But you've already, did, um, the, just the other week, you um, recreated the, the, w the moments after the Big Bang, didn't you? With the, was this quark ion yeah, plasma so or something? Yeah, you can, so you can run the LHC. What we're talking about is running with protons, so hydrogen nuclei. You put, you put those in and you circulate the beams 11,000 times a second. They go around the 27 kilometers and you collide them together. Um, you can also put nuclei, complex nuclei in there. So we've been running with lead nuclei in there, which it was also designed to do. And that, that creates this thing called a quark gluon plasma, as you said, which is like a, a soup of quarks and gluons, so subatomic particles. So it looks very much like the universe did about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. And that's, in a way, different physics, actually. So it's almost the precursor of nuclear physics, whereas what we also do there is particle physics, which is looking for the Higgs particle and all that stuff. But the LHC is a multi-purpose machine and designed to be so. OK, listen, um, you've been a, an absolutely wonderful audience, um, but I would very much like you to put your hands together and, and, and give a massive round of applause to the great Professor Brian Cox. Thank you.